The following program is being brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed in the following program are strictly those of the hosts or guests and do not necessarily reflect the views and ideas held by the Voice America Talk Radio Network, its staff, and management. Welcome to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive with Dr. Rebecca Risk. Do you ever feel that even though nothing seems seriously wrong and you pass all the medical tests, that you still feel that your health, pain, and fatigue are completely out of control? It doesn't have to be that way. Listen to the tips and suggestions given on our program today and take back control of your health. Now, here is Dr. Rebecca Risk. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. Today, we're speaking with Josh Middeldorf, who studies aging from an evolutionary perspective. Originally an astrophysicist, Middeldorf has been a researcher, a writer, and an advocate for the science of anti-aging for 21 years. Today, we're discussing his book, Cracking the Aging Code. So, Josh, welcome to the show. Rebecca, it's great to be here with you. So, what inspired you to write this book? Oh, gee, you know, I've been trying for a long time to get the attention of the evolutionary community. I've got a new idea, and it fits better with the experiments. And I was talking to my mother. It must have been about five years ago. She's 95 now. So she was already well on. But she looked me right in the eye. She said, look, if if you want to get the attention of the experts, go over their heads. Go to the people. That's what Darwin did. Now, 150 years ago, Darwin didn't write a scientific treatise. He wrote a book that every educated person could read. It's beautifully written, and that's what got the attention of the world. So this is a challenge. You know, I, I, I consider myself a writer as well as a scientist. Uh, I, I knew she was right right away. Well, you know, it it does make sense because there there's uh, a lot of talk these days as well about how um, science is actually confusing people and um, it it's they're not understanding. So anything that's more in a language people can understand is going to be understood better and help people more. And it's especially true in the field of evolution. Evolution has just taken a turn toward the dogmatic the last 50 years or so. It's the selfish gene idea, and it's pounded in people's head in grad school that evolution can't do anything that's good for the group. It can only do what's good for the individual. And this is just distorted thinking about evolution for, uh, as I say, the last 50 years. Anybody who's... um, uh, who hasn't got an advanced degree in evolutionary biology thinks, of, of course, sure, evolution is going to do what prevents extinctions, what, help, what helps groups cooperate. But if you've got an advanced degree in evolutionary biology, you say, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. There's only the selfish gene, and that's all there is. So th- that's what I'm up against. So, so what do you mean by the selfish gene? So the the selfish gene is this idea that everything in nature that looks like cooperation isn't really cooperation. It's just genes that we have that are in uh, in common with our close relatives, Um, like the reason that a mother cares for a child or the reason that a sibling would help to rescue another sibling and put his life at risk and tries to understand everything that's cooperative in nature just on the basis of these shared genes because of family lineage. And there's so much more cooperation in nature than that. Gee, I mean, there's lichens that grew up with the uh, algae and and the fungus working absolutely seamlessly, hand in hand, and they have no genetic relation to each other at all. There are whole ecological communities that are adapted to work well together, to 
When one's population gets too big, the other takes over. You can't account for that with a selfish gene. You need to think in terms of a larger picture. We're evolved as ecosystems. We're evolved as species as well. Of course, there's selfishness in nature. It's, all, it's everywhere. But there's also cooperation in nature. And you need a balanced view if you want to understand evolution. Well, you know, I, got, I, I understood a lot of that from, from your book that um, it's not, um, you know, as separate as a lot of people are talking about. And aging seems more complicated as well when you're talking about some, s- some organisms don't age, which, you know, I never really thought about it that way. You're talking about trees, but I think there's some, some other um, organisms as well. So you can just tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, uh, when people say aging is inevitable, it's just the body falling apart, there's nothing we can do about it, I like to cite the instances in nature of, of animals, many plants, and a handful of animals that don't age. Uh, among animals that don't age, there are clams that just seem to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Uh, If you think of aging as an increasing probability of death, well, these clams, once they get to be a certain age, there's nothing that can kill them. They're six feet across, and um, they're not dying of old age. They're not dying of anything else. Um, There are clams that are found that are the same species that you might eat in clam chowder, but they're 600 years old. There are also uh, turtles that live for hundreds of years, Probably whales and sharks, we're not so sure. It's it's hard to find the really, really old ones. Lobsters seem to grow and grow without getting older. So there are a handful of animals that, uh, that grow without aging. And as you said, many plants, many trees don't get older. So um, when, we're, when we're talking about this, I mean, everybody knows, you know, the comments, I'm getting old and that kind of thing. But what does that actually mean that we're aging? Um, there are, I guess you, you could make a practical definition. It means that the body gets more frail, more likely to die and more likely to get sick less able to do things, losing our evolutionary advantage as we get old. Uh, uh, another question, uh, a related question is where does it come from? Well, there's the old idea that the body is just falling apart, the way a knife gets dull, the way uh, the parts in an old car wear out. And the more we see the physiology, the more we realize that's not what's happening. The body's destroying itself from the inside out. It's the hormonal environment that's changed, just as we have hormones when we're 13 years old that uh, the sex hormones start raging. Uh, When we get to be 60, 70 years old, these self-destructive hormones are turning on the body, uh, turning up inflammation, turning up self-suicide, and we're really killing ourselves from the inside out. So do we understand why this happens? Uh, there are different levels on which we could uh, talk about that. There's the one level immediately. It's happening because of epigenetics. You know, you have the same genes in your body that you're born with uh, all your life. This, the, these genes are, are your destiny. And uh, there's nothing you can do to change them. But much bigger than that is the genes that get turned on and turned off at different stages of life and different tissues. And that's the science of epigenetics. Well, epigenetics is the, is the immediate cause of aging. Genes get turned on that, as I say, cause us to destroy ourselves, turn, turn on these self-destructive patterns, destroying the protections that, that we need and actually uh, killing cells in- individually. There's a deeper level at that. Well, you know, why does evolution put up with this? Is evolution supposed to be survival of the fittest and aging destroys your fitness. Uh, so that's, that's really the, my entry into the field. Why would evolution put up with something that destroys the individual when uh, it's supposed to be about crafting the most fitness, uh, 
being a better able to compete and better to make offspring. Well, aging destroys both your ability to compete and your fertility. So you talked a lot about fertility and, and aging, and I'd actually never thought of this before, that technically if we're not fertile anymore, why don't we just die? Um, can you just talk about that theory a little bit? Because that's obviously that's not what happens. <laughs> Oh, it, it, it's a big open question. Of course, the, the um, the mainstream of evolutionary biology. That, that I wasn't the first one to think about evolution and aging in in one breath. Um, for a hundred years, people have been thinking about how does it happen that aging evolved, and the standard answer since nineteen fifty seven. Actually, the standard answer has been that, well, evolution cares about fertility more than anything else. And the reason that we get old is that the body can't do everything well at the same time. You know, there are, um, there are trade-offs. And if the body is going to put all its resources into fertility into making babies as fast and as many as possible, then it's going to shortchange the repair and maintenance functions that keep us healthy, that keep us from, uh, from falling apart. And that's the standard explanation for aging from the evolutionary biologists. And the reason I came into this field is to point out this, this joke just won't fly. It, it stands in contrast to what we know. For example, when we're most fertile in our teens and 20s, the body really isn't aging at all. We're getting, we may even be getting stronger during our teens and getting larger, um, more, more fit, certainly less probable that that we're going to die as as we're growing in our teens. Um, so it's happening at different times. The the um, the body's fertility and the body really falling apart. As you said, most of the falling apart happens after fertility is completely ended. Uh, another prediction from the standard model is that the more babies you have, the shorter you live. And um, this is this is the first thing that comes out of the standard theory of aging. And it's not true. Uh, women who have more children are not more likely to uh, meet an early end. In fact, the demographics show that women who have more children tend to live a little bit longer, the opposite of what the theory predicts. So um, it is, uh, I, I guess the more on the fertility part um is there a relationship with our our hormones and aging i mean I, maybe we've answered this already but just to understand it more i mean men and women live women live longer than men and our fertility ends sooner than theirs so um is that theory actually valid Oh, it, it, it's a big, complicated question, and I don't pretend to know all the answers. But he, here are a few tidbits. One is that um, there's this, why do women outlive their fertility? Why would they go on living from an evolutionary perspective after the evolutionary purpose, which is to produce offspring, is, is, is over? And the standard answer is, well, you know, women have evolved to take care of their grandchildren. And so they're not, they don't need to be fertile anymore, but they're seeing their genes into the future by uh, living in communities where they take care of their grandchildren. Well, it turns out that uh, many, many animals in the wild live longer than their fertility. It's not just women who have human women who have, have menopause. Um, whales and elephants also take care of their offspring and perhaps their grand offspring. Um, so maybe it's not so surprising. But worms, this is the, the lab worms that are used so commonly to study aging, they are fertile for the first three days of their life 
and then they go on to live for 10, 15 days more than that uh, with no fertility at all. They've actually run out of sperm in their bodies, uh, and yet they can c continue to live. Well, nobody's accused worms of taking care of their grandchildren. Um, so th there must be some other explanation for why fertility continues, why life continues even after fertility ends. The technical name is post-reproductive lifespan. Why should worms have it, guppies, fish have it, um, chickens live much longer than they, they lay eggs? All these animals don't take care of their grandchildren, and yet they continue to live beyond their fertility. So, you know, coming back to another aspect of what you're asking, what do sex hormones have to do with aging? Um, there are two female hormones, FSH and LH, follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, that are really important when women are of childbearing age. They come along at, uh, at, at the right time each month to keep the cycle in sync. And they're part of fertility when women are younger. A strange thing happens. After menopause, women don't have any more use for these, fertili for these fertility hormones. And yet they surge into the body. The, uh, they're turned way, way up after menopause. And they're, they serve a self-destructive purpose, uh, keeping FSH and LH down in women after um, after menopause is really a good way to extend life. And perhaps this is a relationship between um, uh, hormone replacement, natural hormone replacement, perhaps uh, has something to do with extending women's lives, making them less susceptible to, to some of the diseases of old age. The, the statistics aren't so clear yet, but certainly LH and FSH are serving us a destructive role and need to be dialed down if we can uh, for women late in life. Okay. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Josh Middledorf. He is the author of Cracking the Aging Code. We're going to be back shortly. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. Have you had a chance to check out Voice America's online magazine and blog, Press Pass? If you love our hosts and shows, check out articles that give an even deeper perspective. Plus topics about health and fitness, movie reviews, philosophy, business tips and tactics, spirituality, positive thought, current events, and even more about your favorite host. It's just a click away at VAPressPass.com. That's VAPressPass.com. VA Press Pass by Voice America. All access, all the time. The Voice America Live Events Channel is here now to showcase your corporate, individual, or organization's live event. Visit voiceamerica.com forward slash live events to see all of our past live events and find out more. Whether it's a multi-day conference, special speaker, or single day event, we've got everything to make your event a success. We can do a few hours or a few days. For more information about taking your event to the next level, call Jeff Spinard at 480-294-294. 6417 or email info at voiceamerica.com. Again, that's Jeff Spinard at 480 294 6417 or send us an email to info at voiceamerica.com. Voice America is where you are and where you want to be. Join us around the globe as we broadcast live from some of the most interesting events available. Don't forget to view all our live events, including on demand access to past events that you may have missed, by visiting voiceamerica.com forward slash live events. Follow the Voice America Talk Radio Network on Twitter. We're at Voice America TRN. You'll get the latest fix on what's happening with our shows, this week's featured guests, and general happenings that you should know about at the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Now you don't have to miss anything when you're away from your home or office. Just go to twitter.com forward slash Voice America TRN or follow along with us at Voice America TRN, the Voice America Talk Radio Network. We're on the cutting edge of social media. Can you keep up? 
These days, everyone is looking for information on staying young, healthy, and fit. The Voice America Health and Wellness Network is here to help you on your quest to better health and a better you. We talk about everything from diet, fitness, and aging to substance abuse, personal growth, mental health, and much more. Learn from our experts who cover health and wellness from traditional and holistic perspectives. Tune in to the Voice America Health and Wellness Network. Healthy living starts here. Opinions, options, answers. You're listening to Voice America Health and Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. We're talking today with Josh Middeldorf. He's the author of Cracking the Aging Code. So, um, Josh, in in your book, you you talk a lot about, you know, the theories of aging. And and then um, there's a lot of talk as well about um, some uh, other things as well. And I think we can go into talking. um, You spoke about epigenetics as you know, being a, um, what can determine things. Um, but what's, is it hormesis? Did I say that right? Hormesis. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Okay. So what is that? This was actually my, uh, introduction to the field. If your thinking is, well, the body's doing absolutely its best to be as strong and healthy as it knows how to be, then you would think that anything that makes life harder can only shorten lifespan and certainly not increase lifespan. Poisons, you know, poisons, you'd think, well, you know, that's going to make you get older faster. Starvation, uh, uh, starvation can't possibly help you live longer. So what I discovered that really piqued my interest way back in the 1990s and brought me into the field is that there are certain hardships that make the body live longer, paradoxically. And starvation is really the prime one. Um, If you're skinny, if you're losing weight, if you're really on the brink of starvation, that's when your life is extended the most. Uh, these in experiments with many different kinds of animals, the most famous are with mice, but they've done this with all kinds of animals. The less they feed them, the longer they live. And this goes right down to the brink of starvation. Um, so this is a hardship, and yet the body responds by being stronger and extending lifespan. You know, you've probably never thought about it in these terms, but exercise, you, you know that exercise helps you live longer. And it, yeah. Uh, it's everybody's joy or everybody's nemesis. It, it depends on your personality. <laughs> exactly. But we all know that exercise is good for us. Well, why should that be? Why should exercise be good for us? Exercise is a stress on the body. It, it turns up those uh, ROS reactive oxygen species that we're all trying to detoxify and destroy. Well, um, uh, exercise makes ROS by the bushel full. It destroys tissues, uh, little cracks in our bones, little tears in our muscles. All this needs repairing. So why should the body be living longer with exercise? as I said, there are toxins, little doses of toxins, and certainly you get, you know, big doses will kill you. But smaller doses, um, they feed paraquat to worms. Paraquat is the it's a powerful pro-oxidant. They use it to spray on the the, the fields to destroy every every form of life. There is, and you feed tiny amounts of it to worms, and the worms can live half again as long as without paraquat. They're poisoning them, and yet they live longer. So these are all examples of what's called hormesis, this paradoxical. It was controversial for a a while uh, until so many examples were proven. 
this controversial and paradoxical phenomenon that uh, animals tend to live longer with hardship than when life is really easy for them. So, you know, it, it's, um, it seems to be a, a fairly new thing or maybe an old thing brought forward, um, hormesis, but, you know, people are talking about fasting way more than they used to. Um, and I did a show last year on it. And, you know, just like the starvation you're talking about is even if you fast w- once a week or reduce your calories, that extends your life. And, you know, it, it almost doesn't make sense that, that that's what's happening, but somehow we must be um, coded that way from an evolutionary perspective that food will be scarce sometimes you know maybe maybe that's what's going on or maybe we don't really understand that yet but I think with what you're saying that there is a lot of studies on fasting now that that does extend life and make you live longer and you know regulate your insulin levels and all those things that um, you know are are new diseases these days Well, if, uh, there's sort of a traditional way to think about it. Uh, sure, we're evolved for times in which food is scarce and the body has to be able to cope with that. But that doesn't begin to explain why the body should live shorter when it has plenty of food. That's really the paradox. And when you, when you look at it that way, you realize there's, there's only one explanation. The body is evolved in, in two modes. If there's plenty of food around, then the body has evolved to make babies as fast as possible and to get out of the way, to die. We're evolved to die and to die early to avoid the population just uh, mushrooming too much when there's plenty of food. On the other hand, in times of scarcity, that's not a good time to be making babies. You probably feed them. You probably starve them. Um, you won't have enough food yourself to be making milk and the babies while they're trying to grow are much more vulnerable to starvation than full grown adults so it's not a good time to reproduce but it's a good time to live as long as possible because gee others in your community may be starving to death there's a famine around Evolution has arranged for us to have longer lifespans, to be protected from aging, so that when there is a famine, the population doesn't all disappear at the same time. Uh, and one of, the, one of the things that we can do to extend our own lives is to take advantage of that and to trigger these signals that say there's a famine around. Uh, you, you have to extend my lifespan. So that could be what what's going on in in North America right now, where food is not scarce, and so we're seeing a lot of uh, increase of diseases, metabolic syndrome, and and uh, the like that are related to the overabundance of food, and perhaps that's the evolutionary standpoint of what's supposed to happen. Uh, Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if I'm getting that right. <laughs> and yeah. then, then you you go into details. So I'm in China right now. I don't know if you mentioned to your uh, your listeners. I, I've got uh, a, a visiting scholarship here at the Beijing Institute for Life Sciences, and I look around me. And there are no fat people anywhere you look in China. You know, in America, you, the obesity rate is skyrocketing, and maybe it's coming in China uh, another decade or two down the road. But for now, people here are admirably thin. There's no obesity in China. They love to eat. I look around me, and, and people are uh, are eating plenty here. So it may have something to do with the the way we eat, the um, the quality of the the kinds of foods that we eat as well as the as the quantity and maybe the social habits around eating. We eat way too much sugar and sugar is the worst for triggering the insulin system that goes haywire as we age. Yeah. So yeah. metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, what it is is the body losing its sensitivity to insulin as we get older. 
insulin is the hormone that comes out to keep sugar down in the bloodstream. And when we lose sensitivity to it, um, the, the, we're having too much sugar in the bloodstream, and that has all kinds of self-destructive effects. So eating sugar actually increases the the body's need for insulin and we become insensitive to insulin over long periods of time. Keeping sugar down may be uh, one of the tricks for um, extending lifespan. And uh, as you said, fasting is a way to kind of condition the body. If you fast periodically, uh, I, I don't eat for one full day a week. Uh, uh, from Wednesday night to Friday morning. I have nothing but water and tea, maybe. Mm-hmm. Well, since uh, I, so I did the... Sh- it's yeah, a schedule ahead. that I can live with. Yeah. Maybe... Uh, you you uh, have to find what, what you can live with. Yeah, you know, since I, I did sorry. the... That's okay. Since I did the show on on fasting, I I do the same thing. There's um, every Friday. Really? I yeah. Um, you know, it it seemed to make sense to me. So, um, uh, I think we do need. And I like food, so to yeah. <laughs> I don't want to restrict my meals. But um, I think it's important for us to go through the the calorie restriction. Um, and once a week makes sense. So it's a you know a day where I I start early in the morning, so I have to make my breakfast, and it kind of works with my schedule. And and um, I think more people should should look at that when we look at the um, the facts as well that this is extending our life, and it's doing many other things for us as well aside from that. One of the things that it does is it clears the body out with senescent cells. Senescent cells are cells that have turned toxic to the body. It's only a tiny percentage, maybe one in a thousand or one in several thousand cells, turns toxic to the body as we get older. But they do enormous damage. And they've made mice live uh, 25% longer just by clearing out these senescent cells. There are um, therapies for humans that are on the way that might promise to do the same thing. But in the meantime, until these arrive, perhaps one of the best things we can do is this, the periodic fast, which kills the senescent cells long before it kills the healthy cells in your body. The healthy cells in your body will react by um, turning up uh, by switching over from burning sugar to burning ketones and the senescent cells can't do that so the senescent cells starve while the healthy cells uh, stay alive uh, clearing out senescent cells is one of the ways in which uh, fasting is healthy for you um, you know, I did a, another show a couple of weeks ago about cold exposure, and it, it was on the, the same um, lines of this where, um, you know, basically you're very uncomfortable because you're cold, and it is increasing the immune system and actually doing a bunch of other things, and this is a fairly new thing, and there's some new studies on it, but I think it goes in that same with the hormesis of being uncomfortable actually lengthens our lives and helps us in some way. Yeah, I listened to that show. It's fascinating. I, I, <laughs> I don't have much tolerance for cold. And, you know, it doesn't go well with the fasting. The, become, the, the body is a little colder. It's harder to keep your temperature up. Yeah. Uh, during the summer, without air conditioning, maybe fasting is, uh, is easier. But... Um, uh, different people have different tolerances, and yeah. uh, I'm I'm fascinated by the idea that cold is healthy and perhaps can extend lifespan. Yeah. Um, so in your book, you also talk about telomeres um, as part of aging. Can you explain what those are? Telomeres. Yeah. Uh, this is the oldest mechanism of. A self-destruction, the, the oldest aging mechanism. Long before there were multi-celled creatures, there were little one-celled microbes, and they have a kind of aging built into them. Uh, they reproduce a certain number of times. Each time they reproduce, their chromosomes get a little bit shorter. 
there's a tail on the end of the chromosome that contains no DNA information, just repetitive DNA. But uh, it's, it's like a nonsense word that repeats again and again and again and again and again. And it's, at first, when you lose a little bit of the tail on the end of the DNA, it, it doesn't have any effect. But it's like a time bomb. Once you get down to a place where the telomere gets too short, then the end of the chromosome itself is affected. Um, microbes actually stop reproducing and die if, they're, if they reproduce too many times. And the cells in our bodies, the same thing. They reproduce a certain number of times and then they stop reproducing. They turn senescent, as I said, they turn toxic to the body when their telomeres get too short. So this has been a theme in aging research the last I'd say, um, I think it was 2002 that the first paper was written showing that short telomeres are an indication that the body is getting old and probably a cause of, of aging itself. These cells that have lost their telomeres become senescent, become toxic to the body, and preserving our telomeres may be a strategy for increasing lifespan in humans. And do we have more of an understanding of that at this point? Like, you know, how to stop this from happening? The other half of the story is uh, um, cells re have been reproducing for a long time. There must be some natural remedy for this. And the body's remedy is a, an enzyme called telomerase which restores the telomeres, makes the chromosomes full length again. It, it contains a little template, a, a blueprint for the repetitive part of the DNA, and it makes copy and copy and copy and copy until the telomeres are just as long as, uh, as they need to be. So this enzyme telomerase, strangely, it's rationed in microbes, and it's rationed in most uh, most animals. In microbes, what happens is that during its whole life, even when it's reproducing, there's no telomerase. It's right there. It's available in the genome, but the body doesn't turn it on. This is epigenetics. The, the, um, the cell doesn't turn on telomerase. Only when a cell has what its form of sex, which is called conjugation, mixing its genes with the genes of another of its species. Then telomerase comes out, the, the telomeres are full length again, and it gives the cell a full, uh, a full deck to work with, a new lease on life. So what happens with these uh, microbes is they can reproduce and reproduce and reproduce. After about 50 generations, they slow down. And unless they can find somebody to mate with, they, they will go into senescence and die. If they can find someone to mate with, then both of them are renewed. They turn on their telomerase and their telomeres are full length again. They're set to go. In people, the same kinds of things seems to be happening. This is really a, a, a fascinating echo from evolution, a mechanism that evolved hundreds of millions of years ago that's still going on in our bodies today and still has to do with why we age today. Um, when we're in the womb, telomerase is turned on and we get a one-time shot of telomerase as an embryo that makes our telomeres full length and set for a lifetime. As we as we live our lives, only tiny amounts of telomerase get expressed, not enough to keep the telomeres from shortening. So our stem cells, the ones that are dividing and dividing, they're getting older, they're losing telomere length, and as I say, they will eventually become toxic to the body in, in old age. Finding natural remedies, finding chemicals that are artificial that can 
uh, induced telomerase, finding activities and lifestyles that tend to produce, produce a little bit more telomerase. These are strategies that are being explored to extend human lifespan through uh, restoring telomeres. Um, you know, I, I always, I love this topic. I did a, a show on it once and I, I think that we, um, you know, we, there's more room obviously for us to understand more on it because I think if we could turn that around, we would have at this point. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely uh, fascinating to understand, especially with how new it is for us. The epigenetics seems to have telomerase locked up really tight. It's not easy to turn it back on. And naturally, it, uh, it only occurs that we only get a really sur real surge of telomerase when we're in the womb. But there mm. are chemicals, natural chemicals, that uh, come from certain plants that give us a little bit of telomerase. There's an extract of the Chinese herb astragalus, there's mm -hmm. ashwagandha, there's silymarin, which is milk thistle. These uh, will give us a little bit of telomerase, and we don't know whether it's enough to really make a difference. Meanwhile, there are labs that are frantically looking for artificial chemicals that might do a much better job than any natural substance. And uh, the, the record holder now is um, 818. I think is it's code named and there's a company in New Zealand that will sell you skin cream with 818 it's it, it holds the record at present for turning on uh, telomerase we don't know about its toxicity or its safety because as I say it's it's an artificial chemical and uh, it's not available in pill form as far as I know um, and even if it were, it doesn't do a very good job. It's it's still a hundredth of what we really need to keep uh, telomere shortening at bay. Um, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking today with Josh Middledorf. He is the author of Cracking the Aging Code. And we'll be back shortly to talk more about this. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. If you think you've seen online TV before, let us surprise you. VoiceAmerica.tv is online now. The leader in live Internet talk radio has done it again. Multiple channels, a state-of-the-art viewing experience, live and on-demand programs streaming 24 hours a day. It's exactly what you want, when you want it. VoiceAmerica.tv. From health and wellness to business, sports, and everything in between. Discover our new world. Visit VoiceAmerica.tv now and experience the future of online television. VoiceAmerica.tv. Take us on the go. It's even easier now. The Voice America Talk Radio Network has launched our mobile app for iPhone, Android, or BlackBerry. Visit the Apple iTunes App Store, BlackBerry App World, or Android Market to download the app powered by Aircast. It's free and no registration is necessary. In minutes, you could be enjoying your favorite Voice America Talk Radio host, no matter where you are, in the car, out and about, while traveling, or anytime you can't be close to your computer. Catch up on the archives you've missed or discover new shows on the spot. Search Voice America at your favorite app store. Have you become a member yet? Sign up now to become a member of Voice America. It's always free and easy. Plus, you get to take advantage of some great member benefits. Get unlimited access to millions of hours of on-demand content across all of our channels. Keep track of your favorite episodes, shows, and hosts in your own customizable library. Find out what shows you might be interested in based on your favorites. Plus, you get insider access with our newsletter. Membership gives you more. Sign up at voiceamerica.com and click register at the top right. Tune in to the Voice America Variety Channel on the Voice America Talk Radio Network. Voice America Variety broadcasts a diverse array of topics reaching a global community. 
Our experts come from all walks of life, and the topics they discuss are everything from current events, arts and entertainment, leadership, parenting, relationships, self-improvement, career advice, and a variety of other topics. Check us out today. You're sure to find something of interest. Voice America Variety. Talk on today's hot topics. Your life, your health, your network. You're listening to Voice America Health & Wellness. You are listening to Falling Through the Cracks with your host, Dr. Rebecca Risk. To reach the program today, please call in to 1-866-472-5792. Again, that's 1-866-472-5792. You may also send an email directly to Dr. Risk. The email address is anantacalgary at gmail.com. Now, back to Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Falling Through the Cracks. We're talking today with Josh Middledorf. He's the author of Cracking the Aging Code. So, Josh, um, you know, when we're talking about all of this, about the evolutionary theory of aging and all these things that are happening when we age, is there a reason why this is important for us to know? Well, sure. I mean, it sounds pretty heady, talking about selfish genes and uh, group selection, why should anybody care about it? Well, it matters because if you think that the body is already doing its best, then you use the approach of it. What it matters for is the study of anti-aging medicine and the research that we're pursuing now for all the diseases of old age. You know, researchers were really successful in solving the problems of hygiene and antibiotics um, inoculations in the 20th century. These things prevented infectious disease and cured infectious disease and uh, lifespan has improved remarkably with this approach of helping the body, figuring out what goes wrong with the body and helping the body to get back on track. And you know, people are Now, there there are these huge research efforts trying to solve cancer and heart disease in the same way. Well, what goes wrong with the body and how can we get the body back on track? And they're not going to work. They're not going to work because people have the wrong understanding about what aging is. Aging is an inside job. It's the body deliberately destroying itself. And if you're trying to get the body back on track, well, guess what? Back on track is destroying itself. You have to find some way to derail this program to trick the body, and the way to do that is with epigenetics. The hormones that are expressed late in life are a toxic combination. And if we switch our approach, I think that anti-aging medicine can really be quite effective, but we, we have to get off this idea that we're fixing what goes wrong with the body and into the idea that we're pushing the body into a different direction that it wasn't designed to go in. We're going to do that by changing gene expression and by changing the hormonal mix in the body. And then it, it's very powerful. We can allay the risk of all the diseases of old age at once with this, this kind of approach. And yet it's, it's still on the fringes of medical research. The mainstream of medical research is still looking for toxins to kill cancer once we get cancer and ways to keep our blood pressure down. Uh, it's misguided. Keeping your blood pressure down is not necessarily going to even prevent heart disease, let alone uh, help you live longer. There's um so when when we're talking about anti-aging, a lot of people talk about it being you know natural anti-aging, but you're saying that aging is natural. So, yeah, so it uh, yeah. it follows from this way of thinking that natural anti-aging is an oxymoron. I like to say it's a contradiction in terms. Yeah, natural is what helps the body get back on track. Well, guess what? Back on track is aging and death. The body is designed to age. It's doing what it's designed to do. 
And natural mechanisms can't help the body to change its course. It can only put the body back on its natural course. Um, so when we're also talking about the the evolution of of aging, and then you know if we're trying to live a really long time, is there an effect on our surroundings if we're living longer than we're, you know, meant to? Well, gee, Rebecca, this is the hardest question for me, and it keeps me up at night. And you know, I wonder. Uh, my the theory that I've been putting out is that. Aging evolved for the good of the group to keep the population in check, to keep the population from overrunning the ecosystem. And as life has been extended, maybe the last 200 years of human history, humans have been doing exactly what nature has been trying to prevent. Humans are overrunning the earth, driving many other species into extinction, cutting off the ecological foundation on which all life depends, including human life. We, we don't know that humans can survive without the ecological foundation of a healthy earth. And yet, here we are uh, rapidly destroying one environment after another as humans uh, spread over the earth. Uh, I don't know whether it's uh, immoral to be thinking about longer lifespans. Uh, That's the question I really wrestle with. But I do know that if you're going to advocate for longer lifespans, in parallel with that, you really have to be thinking strict population control, keeping the birth rate down to match the death rate. Um, The human population is really the primary driver of ecological destruction. And anybody who's an advocate for longer lifespans has to automatically be an advocate for birth control and population control mechanisms really worldwide. You know, I, I think if I've learned anything doing all these shows, we're, we're also hurting ourselves. You know, every show seems to have the same theme of, of uh, you know, toxins or food or um, something that isn't working right in the direction that that we're, our society is going in, at least here in North America. Um, so I, I think the the main thing that we should be focusing on is to to live the last years of our life and our life in health and um and happiness and whether or not that extends it or not at least it's a quality of life instead of a quantity sure um there's uh, when people think of life extension there's the misconception that well you know, once you're in the nursing home, and we're just going to keep you holding on a little bit longer um, by these heroic means of keeping the body going after it's really designed to fall apart. Well, life extension, life extension science isn't about that. It's about extending our healthy years, uh, the years when we're already vibrant. And that works so much better and it's so much easier. And fortuitously, it's also what we want. We want to uh, extend our middle years when we're active, when we're uh, enjoying life most and not to extend our disabled years. And and in fact, that's what anti-aging medicine is designed to do. That's what anti-aging medicine does well. Okay. Well, I want to... It, we are going to have to end the show, but if there's any um, way people can get more information or find your book, um, how can they do that? Sure. It's Cracking the Aging Code, and it's just come out in paperback a few weeks ago. So it's uh, cheaper now. You should be able to find it easily online or in your local bookstore. I have a website where all of my health advice is compiled in one place, agingadvice.org. And there's a blog, agingmattersblog.org is um, the science blog where I, I, every couple of weeks I have comments on science news, comments on evolution, and also tips on the finer points of how to keep yourself healthy. Well, perfect. Well, um, thank you so much for joining me today. 
Well, I'm really glad you reached out to me. Rebecca, I've been a fan of your uh, show for a long time, and it's an honor to be here with you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Today we were talking to Josh Middeldorf. He's the author of Cracking the Aging Code. Uh, Thank you so much for listening today, and be sure to make today a great day. Thank you for tuning in to this week's edition of Falling Through the Cracks. Feel alive and thrive. Please join Dr. Rebecca Risk again next Monday at noon Eastern Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. We'll talk more next week. Thanks again for listening to the preceding program brought to you on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. For more information about our network and to check out additional show hosts and topics of interest, please visit voiceamericahealth.com. The Voice America Talk Radio Network is the worldwide leader in live Internet talk radio. Visit voiceamerica.com. The views and ideas expressed on the preceding program are strictly those of the host or guests and do not necessarily reflect.